I never thought of Florida as a jungle. In my mind, it's always been more of a family vacation spot. Sunny skies, warm beaches, and theme parks right off every major superhighway. But, as we discovered when we moved to Florida, lurking in the corners of every suburban yard are little reminders that this vacation paradise continues to be inhabited by all manner of creepy, crawly creatures. People may have moved in, but the bugs, snakes, and lizards didn't move out. In fact, some people, like my wife, think Florida was never meant for human habitation, and she's not even an environmentalist. No, her sentiments are much more practical. She simply can't stand anything with six legs, or worse, eight legs, or worse yet, no legs at all. Speaking of eight legs, be very careful as you walk about in this jungle, because you will definitely run into spiders. That's one way to get rid of a spider. Fortunately, our spiders don't get quite that large. In fact, this is an example of one of the largest spiders you'll see in a suburban Florida jungle, the golden silk spider. Commonly called a banana spider because of its body shape, the golden silk is part of a larger group of spiders known as orb weavers. Their orb-shaped webs are made of very strong silk, which looks like gold thread in the sunshine giving them the name Golden Silk Spiders. These webs can be as much as three feet across. A single spider can weave up to six different kinds of silk. Some types are so strong that scientists are studying ways to use it for people. Dragline silk, the thread that a spider hangs from while dropping down, is the strongest. The dragline of a Golden Silk Spider is almost as strong as Kevlar, the material used in bulletproof vests. The male golden silk spider is much smaller than the female. While the body of the female can grow to over one inch long, the male's body will only grow to about one quarter of an inch. I tried to get my son to hold a quarter next to this specimen, but he never got close enough to get in the frame. I had to do the honors. Even though these spiders are big and ugly, they are essentially harmless to humans. They rarely bite people, and when they do, it's about the same as a bee sting. The barn spider is another orb weaver. Unlike the golden silk spider, which waits in the middle of its web for prey to arrive, the barn spider sits above its web during the day. Silk lines attached to the web signal when prey has been caught. When this happens, the barn spider rapidly runs down the web to wrap its meal in silk. Barn spiders usually build their webs in shady areas, like this overhanging area of our roof. As their name suggests, they can also be found building their webs in barns. Other areas include caves, mine openings, and overhanging cliffs. One of the most common spiders found in the suburban Florida jungle, and just about everywhere else in North America, is the thin-legged wolf spider. There are over 100 species of wolf spider, and it takes a specialist to tell one from the other. Wolf spiders are active hunters. They search for and attack their prey on the ground rather than build webs and wait for dinner to arrive. They generally have better eyesight than their web-weaving relatives, helping them in their pursuit of prey. Although they don't build webs, wolf spiders still use silk. The female wraps her eggs in a big silk sack and drags it around as she moves about. If it breaks loose, she will search for it and reattach it to herself with silk. When the young spiderlings hatch, they will ride on their mother's back until they are partially grown. Wolf spiders can be found around doors and windows in the fall as they seek out warmer areas. However, it is only by accident that they end up inside a house. Their natural habitat is outdoors where there is a plentiful supply of food. Furthermore, they are not poisonous. 
even though a bite from a wolf spider can cause some irritation. Another group of hunters are the jumping spiders, of which there are over 4,000 species worldwide. This daring jumping spider is hunting for food around our front door. Jumping spiders, as they move along, leave behind them a silk anchor line. This line will protect them when they jump to catch prey or if they should fall accidentally. Their anchor line, in this case, works just like a mountain climber's safety rope. After they catch their prey, they will scurry back up the line to eat their meal. Like other hunters, jumping spiders have excellent eyesight. Jumpers are very good at catching their prey because, along with their good vision, they can jump up to 40 times their own body length and they can even jump sideways. Frequent safaris and careful observation are necessary to catch all that might be going on at one time or another in your jungle. This excursion into the wild turned up one of the more interesting spiders I've seen so far. The black and yellow argiope, sometimes called the garden spider, is an orb weaver. But it doesn't weave just any old ordinary orb. The argiope adds thick silk in the shape of a cross right in the middle of its web. While no one is quite sure why they do this, one theory is that this large cross warns birds against flying right through the web thus ruining a hard day's work by the spider. On a follow-up safari to see how our garden spider was doing, I noticed that she had moved her web. Upon closer inspection, I was amazed to see what she caught. While it was obvious that there was something much bigger than herself in that web, it took a moment to figure out what it was as she had already wrapped it up in silk. Much to my surprise, it turned out to be a lizard. The fact that one of our many lizards stumbled into this web is not as surprising as the fact that the web didn't immediately get pulled apart. Of course, now that I know these webs are built of something almost like Kevlar, I guess I shouldn't be so surprised. Later, when the poor lizard had served its purpose, the Argyope dropped it to the ground and repaired her web. Compared to a spider, that's a fairly large lizard. I wondered just how big the lizards in this jungle get. Fortunately, our lizards don't get quite large enough to eat people. Still, that's about the same reaction my wife has to any one of our three to four inch lizards. And that's just large enough for a lizard to turn around and eat the spiders that try to eat them. That's exactly what this six-lined race runner is doing. Sometimes called whiptail lizards, this specimen is probably fairly young since it still has a blue tail, which turns brown in adults. Although six-lined lizards are very common in Florida, this is the only one ever spotted in our little jungle. Far more common are green anoles. These lizards seem to be just about everywhere, and that may be a good thing. While you may not like them, they eat the insects that you like even less. Anoles are hunters, catching flies, beetles, spiders, and even small crabs. Like other hunters, they have excellent vision to help land their prey. Green anoles aren't always green. Like chameleons, anoles can change their color. They can change from bright green to dark brown and back again in seconds. However, they are not true chameleons. In fact, these small lizards are more closely related to iguanas. The color that a green anole happens to be at any moment may have more to do with its body temperature or even its mood than it does with trying to blend into the background. If the weather is over 70 degrees, they remain green most of the time. In colder weather, they turn brown. The outcome of a fight over territory with another male can change an anole's mood and with it its color. The winning and therefore happier lizard turns green while the losing, and presumably sadder, lizard turns brown.
green anoles are often seen displaying their red throat fan, which is also called a dewlap. Males have a larger dewlap than females and will display it to defend their territory from another invading male. They might also use this display to attract a female as a mate. Anoles are almost always seen on the sides of houses, fences, or trees, but are rarely seen on the ground. In the wild suburban Florida jungle, green anoles can live up to two or three years. They are commonly found as pets and can do well in captivity if taken care of properly. We have a fierce predator at the top of the food chain in our mighty jungle, but this lion isn't sleeping tonight. She's on the hunt for lizards. Poor Mimi. There always seems to be something between her and her quarry. You have to admire her persistence because she never gives up. One day, a brown anole found itself stuck between the outer screen and glass pane of the kitchen window. It wasn't long before our brave cat, always on the prowl, discovered this trapped lizard and did her best to catch it. Brown anoles, sometimes called Cuban or Cuban brown anoles, are related to green anoles, but they are not native to Florida. Brown anoles were introduced into Florida some years ago from their natural habitat in Jamaica, Cuba, or the Bahamas. They are not known to have spread beyond the Florida Peninsula. Brown anoles also are very territorial, and along with displaying their throat fan, will bob up and down vigorously to warn off intruding males. They never venture far from the ground and generally position themselves head down so that they can quickly dart back to the ground when they feel threatened. Like snakes, lizards shed their skin as they grow. The skin sheds in pieces, so unlike snakes, you will never find a complete lizard skin. Brown anoles can't change their color to green, but they can change to a very dark brown, and in some cases, to jet black. Jungle predators often prey on the weakest member of a group of animals because they are the easiest to catch. Perhaps Mimi was hoping that the loser of this battle of the lizards would hobble her way and become an easy target. Although difficult to identify, these lizards are possibly large brown anoles, which can grow to be eight inches long. However, their body shape indicates that they might be crested anoles, which were introduced into the Miami area of Florida from the Caribbean islands some years ago. Every now and then a lizard, or some other jungle creature, finds its way into our screened-in pool area. Since this is one place where Mimi is allowed to hunt, we have to catch and release the poor creatures before Mimi does. The Indo-Pacific, or house gecko, is another lizard not native to Florida. These lizards were introduced into the area from Southeast Asia. Now very common, they are often seen on walls at night hunting for insects attracted by nearby lights.
An unusual feature of Indo-Pacific geckos is that they are unisexual. All individuals are female and have the ability to self-fertilize their eggs. No males are known to exist among these lizards. Occasionally, one of these creepy crawly creatures finds its way into our house. Since my wife insists that she'll move into a hotel if I don't catch the beast, everything else stops until I do so. This poor gecko has been so traumatized by the ordeal that it shed its tail. Like many lizards, geckos do have the ability to cast off a part of their tail when threatened. While a new tail will grow back, it will be shorter and will lack the vertebrae of the original. The cast off piece has muscles that continue to twitch and hopefully attract the attention of the predator while the rest of the gecko escapes. Every safari taken around our jungle has the potential to reveal new and exotic creatures. More often than not, these creatures are found clinging to or scurrying across the walls of our house. I wonder what might land on it next. Moths might grow that large on some remote Japanese island, but this Acrea moth, which landed on Jimmy's window screen, isn't any more than two inches long. The Acrea moth is found throughout North America, except in northern Canada. Their preferred habitat, when not trying to crush houses, is in fields, pastures, and marshes. Moths are most often found hanging around our front porch. Perhaps they are still resting from the previous evening, having been attracted here by our porch lights. This dried leaf, stuck to the front door, is in fact one of the sphinx moths, the mournful sphinx. While searching out the identity of this well-camouflaged bug, I came across this map posted on the U.S. Geological Survey website, showing confirmed sightings of the mournful sphinx. So far, they have not reported seeing this moth in our very own Marion County in northern central Florida. Who knows, perhaps as a result of our sighting, we'll get our county changed from white to blue on this map. Another of the sphinx moths found on the porch is this Tursa sphinx. However, the most interesting sphinx we've seen so far is the white-lined sphinx. When seen flying around flowers, this moth can easily be mistaken for a hummingbird. There is, in fact, another sphinx very much like this one that is called the hummingbird moth. You have to be thorough in your safaris if you want to find creatures that might otherwise be hidden. And you have to look closely to be sure of what you see. What at first appeared to be one moth turned out to be a pair of clear oakworm moths a male and a female caught in the act of making more clear oakworms. Like all moths, oakworms start out life as a caterpillar. When in that stage of their life, they are voracious feeders and can quickly strip the leaves off many trees. However, more damage is done to the tree's appearance than to its overall health. Most trees survive the feeding frenzy of these eating machines. Once again, things are not always as they seem in the jungle. I caught a glimpse of this flying insect and immediately thought I was looking at a large and very colorful wasp. However, I could not find such a wasp in any of the insect books I was able to refer to. 
In fact, I wasn't able to find this insect under any heading. Finally, I resorted to asking the experts on the internet, who graciously offered to look at a picture and identify this mystery bug. It turned out to be a moth, the polka dot wasp moth, in fact. Of course, that's not the scientific name for this creature, but a perfect name nonetheless. The polka dot wasp moth differs from other moths not only in appearance, but in some other ways as well. While most moths are active at night, the wasp moth does its flying and feeding during daylight hours. Also, most other moths, when they want to find a mate, emit chemicals into the air that each other can smell called pheromones. Moths will find each other by locating the source of the scent. However, when the female polka dot wasp moth wants to call her man, she perches on a flower and sends out an ultrasonic sound that humans cannot hear. When her mate comes within a few yards of her position, they sing to each other in courtship until the early hours of the morning. While most of the moths in our jungle seem content to hang around on walls all day, this is not the case among our butterfly population. One of the first to be seen in our little Florida jungle was none other than the Florida state butterfly, the zebra longwing. The largest of all butterflies are the swallowtails, and the most common swallowtail in the United States is the eastern tiger swallowtail. In spite of its name, the eastern tiger swallowtail can be found as far west as the Rocky Mountains and north into Canada. Occasionally, females of this species can be found that are almost completely black. When born this way, they appear very much like the pipe vine swallowtail which happens to taste very bad when eaten by a predator. These predators quickly learn to avoid such black butterflies, which explains why there are so many black eastern tiger swallowtails. In nature, one species is said to mimic the other in these situations. Another mimic is the giant swallowtail, only it's not the butterfly itself that mimics something else. It's this butterfly's caterpillar, when in that stage of its life, the giant swallowtail caterpillar looks like a bird dropping. It's not hard to understand why most predators would look elsewhere for their next meal. Giant swallowtails are indeed among the giants of all butterflies and can grow to have a wingspan of six and one quarter inches. Hair streaks are small butterflies with thin, hair-like tails that project from their hind wings, although a few species of hair streaks lack these tails. The largest of this group of butterflies is the great purple hair streak. Purple hair streaks are generally found around trees which are being parasitized by mistletoe, which is where they lay their eggs. They rarely come close to the ground, preferring to stay high up in the trees near their mistletoe homes. The white M hair streak is similar in appearance to the great purple hair streak, but is a bit smaller and lacks the red belly of the purple hair streak. It gets its name from a white pattern of lines on its wings that looks like the letter M, although it can't readily be seen here. This beautiful butterfly is the Gulf Fritillary. As its name suggests, it is found in abundance around the Gulf of Mexico and can occasionally be seen flying far out over the water. Due to its bold color pattern, this butterfly is sometimes called the silver spotted flambeau. Like the black pipe vine swallowtail, Gulf fritillaries taste bad to predators, which helps them survive in great numbers. Large migrations of these butterflies occur from the southeast. When in the caterpillar stage, this and other butterflies will molt their skin several times before the final molt, which produces the pupa or chrysalis. The chrysalis of the Gulf fritillary looks like a dried up leaf, once again causing possible predators to look the other way. The adult butterfly will emerge from the chrysalis fully formed and whose main purpose in life is to mate and create more Gulf fritillaries. Farmers don't particularly like this butterfly, which is a long-tailed skipper. 
Sometimes they call it the bean leaf roller because its caterpillar eats the leaves off bean plants, killing much of their crop. One day, while sitting at my desk in the corporate jungle, I received a frantic phone call from my wife. There's a snake in the pool, a man-eating snake. Yes, I can come home right away. I'll take an early lunch just to keep Jimmy and the pets away from the pool. On the drive home, I couldn't help but wonder, how in the world am I going to catch a man-eating snake? Nobody move. Buenas noches. Oh no, I was afraid of this. That man-eater must have gotten one of the pets. Jimmy looks so sad. But where is the snake? Well, we can all rest easy. The killer turns out to be a southern ringneck snake, probably a full-grown adult, no less. Southern ringnecks can grow to the enormous length of 8 to 12 inches. Although reclusive, they are very common in the Florida jungle and are often seen on safaris to the flower garden. These little snakes get their name from the light-colored rings seen around their neck. Southern ringnecks are not poisonous, and they rarely even attempt to bite. They prey on earthworms, small lizards, and newborn snakes. Before swallowing their meal whole, they coil around it like a constrictor to stun it. In fact, in my research to learn more about this little snake, I actually came across a picture of a brave ringneck that must have thought it really was a man-eater. I was myself actually attacked by another kind of jungle snake. One day, as I opened our front door, something dropped onto my shoulder, then fell to the ground. I was a bit startled, but when I looked down and saw what attacked me from above, I was stunned. A snake, and a colorfully marked one at that. Surely a snake with these markings must be poisonous. Having narrowly escaped with my life on yet another exciting day in the jungle, I hit the books to find out what this creature was. It's a corn snake, sometimes called a rat snake. And it's probably a baby, since corn snakes hatch from their eggs when they are about 11 inches long. Not only are corn snakes not poisonous, I learned that they make good pets. In fact, corn snakes are one of the most popular snakes in the pet trade today, and are easily bred in captivity in a wide range of colors and patterns. Corn snakes can live up to 21 years of age in captivity. These snakes are excellent climbers, which helps explain how it got to the top of our screen door. In fact, this one seems to want to climb back up. Since I really don't want snakes, even ones that make good pets, falling on ours or visitors' heads, I discouraged this one from making our door its home. During a safari many months later, when I was actively looking for creatures instead of having them just appear unexpectedly, a dark spot caught my eye. This seemed odd, so I took a closer look. Once again, a juvenile corn snake decided to use our house as a resting spot. It had climbed as high up as it could under the eave and curled up for a good sleep. Perhaps it had just eaten and needed a safe place to digest its meal. As one of its names suggests, these snakes eat small rodents like rats and mice, although they sometimes eat birds and birds' eggs. The name corn snake is believed to come from the similarity of the markings on its belly to the kernels on Indian corn. When you live in a jungle, just coming home for lunch can be an adventure. On one such expedition, I went in the house and found Nanette nearly paralyzed, staring out the kitchen window as a southern black racer was looking for its own lunch in our tree. Since the camera is never far, she was able to coax her frozen legs to take the few steps necessary to grab it and record this attack on our home.
Black racers are probably the most frequently seen snake in the Florida jungle. This is due to the fact that not only do they thrive in urban and suburban areas, they are also quite active during the day. Although black racers are not poisonous, they will bite. So, unless you are something of an expert, it's not a good idea to try to catch one. I caught a glimpse of a black racer myself one day, but true to its name, it raced away before I could get a good look at it. We came across another snake-like creature that will forever remain a mystery since we couldn't get a good look at it. While it appears to be a rather large earthworm, it's very unusual to see earthworms crawling about in the open on a hot sunny day. Perhaps it's an example of the worm lizard, a legless lizard that usually lives underground searching for termites and earthworms. There is very little doubt that this strange looking creature is a worm, but a worm the likes of which I had never seen. In fact, after a number of trips to the library and other searches produced no results, I once again turned to the experts on the internet. They were able to identify this animal as a free-living, land-dwelling flatworm. These flatworms are identified as free-living because most of the 15,000 species of flatworms are parasites, which live inside another animal their entire lives. These are further characterized as land-dwelling because most of the free-living flatworms live either in the ocean or in freshwater lakes and rivers. Fortunately, the flatworms in our Florida jungle are not parasites, nor are they harmful to humans. Furthermore, the only time we see them is after a good rain. In order to move about, they secrete a slippery liquid from their bellies and glide over it. If they stay out too long and don't get back to the damp area from which they emerged, they will die of dehydration. While we often see empty snail shells lying about in the jungle, the only time we see their living relatives is also after a good rain. In fact, so many snails crawl out of their hiding places that at times it gets difficult to walk on the driveway. It just wouldn't be a jungle without frogs, and we have those too. One of the most common in Florida is the green tree frog. In spite of its name, these frogs are often seen clinging to window panes or on the side of a house. Although they can jump when frightened, they prefer to walk which is what this camera shy individual did when he had enough of me. Like the occasional lizard, small frogs often find their way into our pool area. It is not at all uncommon to find four or five of these tiny greenhouse frogs hiding in the corners or under pool toys. Also, like some of our lizards, greenhouse frogs were introduced into Florida many years ago and are now quite common all around the Florida Peninsula. Unlike all other frogs and toads in Florida, greenhouse frogs do not go through a free-swimming tadpole stage. Fully developed, very tiny froglets hatch directly from their eggs. Always alert for anything that moves, our fierce jungle cat, Mimi, is often the first to notice when these frogs have invaded our patio. After seeing all of these spiders, lizards, snakes, and frogs around the house, 
I couldn't help but wonder what was going to pop up next. Of course, I should have known. Beetles. After all, one out of every five animals living on Earth is a beetle. That's right, 20% of all living creatures of any kind are beetles of one sort or another. So far, we haven't seen any that are big enough to ride on. This green June beetle is foraging among the flowers of the same bush where most of our butterflies are found. Many beetles are considered to be pests by farmers and gardeners, and the green June beetle is no exception. Its larvae are particularly harmful to the roots of tobacco, killing the plants themselves. This longhorned beetle, also known as a pine sawyer, hitched a ride on my car. These beetles are not harmful to crops, but their larvae will feed on weakened or stressed trees. However, they usually feed on dead or dying trees. The larvae of pine sawyer beetles are known as round-headed borers. Once again, the front porch has proved to be a great source of new creatures. Although large, this scarab beetle still isn't big enough to sit on. There are many different kinds of scarab beetle, including ladybugs and the green june beetle we saw earlier. This particular scarab is usually found in dead hardwood trees. Our jungle neighbors may sometimes wonder why they see me walking around with my head down. It's done so that I don't miss exotic creatures like this, that only come by once in a great while. What at first appeared to be a large and brightly colored ant turned out, in fact, to be a wasp a wingless wasp, which is also part of a group of wasps called velvet ants. It took a drop of honey to get this fast-moving creature to slow down long enough to get a good look at it. This particular wingless velvet ant wasp is called the cow killer. It gets that name from its powerful sting, which some people claim is so painful that it could kill a cow. Cow killers and other wingless wasps do not live in groups and hives like other wasps and bees. These are solitary insects. However, female cow killers do lay their eggs in hives. They lay them inside bumblebee hives, dropping one egg beside each bumblebee brood chamber. What better way to end our story than with a shot of our very own Florida leaf-footed bug? Like stink bugs, Florida leaf-footed bugs will secrete a bad-smelling liquid when they are handled. Of course, Florida isn't the only state with backyards that appear to be jungles. Every yard, everywhere, has its own creepy, crawly, slithering, or flying inhabitants. Take a safari yourself, you'll see. But beware, you might find more bugs than you ever imagined.
jungle in the